Welcome back. Welcome back to An Athlete's Journey. I'm your host, Travis Reed, and today we are doing part two of the episode with my big bro, Corey. You know, we're going to finish the rest of his uh, his journey. Um, we ended at him with Long Beach State, transferring to Long Beach State. We didn't get anything after that, but we ended with him transferring to Long Beach State. And we're going to go from Long Beach State to what happened after that and what's going on after that. So we appreciate y'all for coming through and listening. And uh, like I said, Corey, we want to just get right into it. So you make the decision. You leave uh, Coach Sampson from Oklahoma. You go to Long Beach State with a lot of uh, a lot of your friends. And this is where I met him. I met Corey, like, officially. He was uh, at Long Beach when I, like, went on my recruiting trip visit. Me, my dad, and my stepmom. And he was just a good guy, you know, even though I saw him before lots of times. I never really spoke to him, so I, you know, this is my first time I'm meeting him. But go ahead, Corey. Well, yeah. Um, basically, um, let me think about it. I left. I left Long Beach. No, I left Oklahoma. Um, Samson came in. I knew he was. I wasn't one of his guys or whatever. Mm-hmm. And um, I was watching at my ex, well, my girlfriend at the time at Oklahoma. I was watching ESPN and the uh, the pyramid had just been completed. Mm-hmm. They just completed the pyramid. Um, I'm at her place watching the game, and I'm like, like, damn, there go Everett Ratliff, there go uh, uh, Keely Jackson, James Cotton, uh, Joaquin Hawkins, uh, Gary Branner. I didn't know Gary at the time. Uh, I think they had Brian Yankelevich on the team. And yep, B. Yank, yep. Young Craig B. Yank, uh, and who else? Fuck. Jamie Dixon and Eric Brown, Rasul Salahuddin, who's like my number one guy right now. He's what well, I'm not saying right now in LA. Rasul and me, when I transferred to Long Beach, we just clicked. You know, we was he was older than me. He was from Mount Vernon, New York. On my mom's side, I got a family from Harlem out there. We've been in New York, and me and him just clicked right away. So <clears throat> I looked at the game and I looked at you know that they were playing in the pyramid, an arena that I never thought was going to be built. You know, uh, Greenberg used to try to convince me, like, yeah, I'm going to be playing in the gold mine. And I was like, Greenberg, you got me you got me wanting to come here, but I'm going to be playing in, like, this Cracker Jack box. Over there. <laughs> I just to ring that. I, I'm, I'm used to looking at the Carrier Dome. I'm used to looking at uh, the, the Kansas Arena and, 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 and you know, um, the UNLV's arena. I'm like, I don't want to play in the gold mine. <laughs> he said, he said, he said, Corey, I'll show you the plans and the pyramids coming. And nah, 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 nah. I didn't know Long Beach State had that much money. I didn't think it was going to be built. And lo and behold, turn on the TV, late game, the pyramid. And I mean, the smoke is everywhere. I'm like, oh, shit, I got to get back to the crib. So I called Greenberg and I said, Coach, you know, I'm not, it's not going to work out here. Tubbs is left. I'm thinking about coming back to the crib. You got a scholarship for me. He said, yeah. He said, if you want to come back, I got you. So I transfer in. Mind you, I got to sit out. So now I got to sit out another year. It's not like it is now where you could transfer and play right away. You know, we missed, you know, we missed the boat on that. So now Mm -hmm. I got to go to Long Beach. I got to sit out. I'm a little frustrated because people are like, where's Corey? He's not playing. He pretty much red-shirted at Oklahoma. Now he has to sit out at um, Long Beach. So I sit out. It's me, James, because James had got hurt the year before. And then it's uh, uh, um, damn, uh, Brandon Titus. I'm sorry. I went blank. We were just talking about Brandon. Yeah, yeah, Brandon yeah. Titus. So Brandon comes in from LSU. I'm coming in from Oklahoma. Now you got James Cotton. It's all in the paper that the next year after, Long Beach is going to have this strong backcourt because I played like the two, three. Brandon was the one and James was the two. Then you had Akili Jackson. You still had Ever Ratliff, uh, Joaquin Hawkins. So we pushing them in practice. Me, James, and Brandon is killing them in practice. I mean, we're going to work. You know what I'm saying? I'm ready because I'm trying to prove myself. You know, Greenberg, you know, has me situated at this point. You know, we would set me up with an apartment. Me and Akili became roommates because me and Akili had played against each other in high school. He went to Sarah. I went mm-hmm. to Montana. So we used to play a non-conference game together. So against each other, I mean. So 
you know, there's some familiarity there. You know, I know who James is. Me and his brother Shea is close. So James is my guy. So James took me under his wing and we start training together. And if anybody knows James Cotton, you going, if you go in the weight room with James Cotton, you in the motherfucking weight room. And you, <laughs> you in there for about two hours. And it's what I needed because now I had all this time being on campus at Long Beach and I couldn't play. The only thing I could do was practice because when you transfer, as you know, you got to sit out that whole year. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm getting better and better. I'm killing. I'm I'm taking cats off the dribble. B Titus is hitting the jumper. James is doing his thing. So our practice squad, which was practicing against the guys that was playing, was killing or being very competitive against the starters. Because now you got, you know, us three leading the way. And I got all this time on campus. So me and Keely staying together. We got a two-bedroom apartment. We got the girls over there. We got a couple parties. <laughs> and I'm like, damn, I got all this time on my hand. What am I doing? So I get introduced to a bunch of Kappas. And I didn't really know that Akili at the time was pledging Kappa. So we, he was, his dad had played at Long Beach State. And then, you know, following in the tradition, Akili played at Long Beach. And then his dad was a Kappa. Akili became a Kappa. Mm -hmm. So I got kind of thrust into that whole uh, sorority, uh, fraternity, sorority type of environment, going to the parties, having fun, you know, because I had all this time on my hand. I couldn't travel with the team. I mean, I could, but I never really... It was no use of me going. I felt like I could might just stay back and work out. So me and James was working out. And um, when I was in the weight room, we were doing this leg exercise, trying to build, trying to get me to be more explosive. James could already jump out the gym. I was more of a one foot jumper off my left leg. That was my strongest leg. I never was really a explode too, but James was teaching me how to do that. And he was showing me the different um, exercises in the weight room, how to do it. Well, this one particular time we're doing calf raises and I feel a sharp, a really sharp uh, pain in my left leg. And I'm like, damn, that's odd. What is that? And it kind of lingers for the next week or so. So then I had to tell coach, like, coach, I think something's wrong with my left leg. I need to get examined. Coach said, okay, let's take him to the hospital, get it looked at. What happened? there was a calcium deposit growing on my bone, tearing into my calf muscle. Out Ouch. Of a, yeah, some fluke type shit. So they had to perform surgery on me. So now it's like, do I do the surgery? Do I try to continue to play or whatever? And the doctor said, if you don't have the surgery to, re and now rem imagine a, a shark's tooth and it's connected, it, it's growing on your bone and it's tearing into your calf. And that's my strongest leg because when I go off one foot, I'm that's going it, yeah. the left, you know, with my left leg. That's my strongest leg. They cut me so bad once I had the surgery and they cleaned up the, the, the calcium deposit. But the way he cut me, it was almost like I had blown an ACL. So everybody that would see the scar on the left side of my leg would say, Hey, did you have, did you blow your knee out? I was like, nah, I just had, you know, a cleanup surgery for a calcium deposit. But man, I'm telling you, that thing set me back so much that Greenberg wanted to red shirt me to give me a medical red shirt. So that would have been three years of me not playing ball. First year at Oklahoma where I played some preseason games, but he tubs decided to red shirt me mm -hmm. in the transfer. Now you're asking me to set out three years straight. And I couldn't handle that. And mm -hmm. I should have listened to Coach Greenberg. I look back on it now. I should have listened to him because James did the same thing. James got hurt and he decided that he wanted to red shirt just to physically get stronger, which he was already stronger, and to work on his game. I didn't see the vision. At that time, you wanted to hurry up, play college, and try to get to the pros as fast as possible. Right. I didn't understand. I didn't have the guidance from anybody else but Greenberg and the rest of the coaching staff. And he was like, Corey, why don't you just red medical red shirt and then you'll be ready to come back with James. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And my leg never really got healed properly because what happened after the surgery, you get scar tissue. So now I have a ton of scar tissue surround, uh, surrounded by, I mean, surrounding the nerve that that shoots the blood up and down my left leg to give it 
the blood that it needs. The scar tissue was shutting that off. So what would happen if I got into the game and somebody need me in that leg, I would crumble straight to the ground because I had no feeling in that leg. And mm. that was the, that was the reason why my career at that point took a drastic turn because I couldn't get by guys anymore. I, my left leg was the leg that I pushed off with. That's how I got my explosiveness. I could not do what I was, was able to do on the court. So when I had the surgery, I literally had to wait the whole year anyway. I, I, I couldn't play. So I missed that season as well. The, the, um, the head trainer at the time, he used to tell me, Corey, when you go home after practice, get one of your little girlfriends or somebody to come home, or, you know, come see you so they could physically take their hand and rub and massage the scar tissue so it'll soften up. Because if it gets hard, it's like a brick around a nerve. And you won't, my leg would literally go numb. My legs would literally go numb. And, 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 and they would shoot my leg up before practice just so I could, just so I could practice. Man. So, yeah, a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people think his career didn't pan out because he wasn't good enough. Or da, da, da. I had surgery. I had three surgeries. I had three surgeries. And, 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 and to Greenberg's defense, he did try to put me in the game. You know, once 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 the year was over after my surgery and the leg kind of healed a little bit, Greenberg would put me in the game. I remember he put me in the game against UNLV, and um, we're at home and I'm playing. I get a rebound. Somebody knocks into my leg. I could I couldn't get up. I had no feeling in my leg. It took two players to carry me off the court because I had a dead leg. My leg was literally dead. And what happened, Travis? The initial first surgery there needed to be another cleanup surgery to clean up the scar tissue. So you just have to imagine a, a, a brick, um, just imagine cement uh, growing around a nerve. And every time you hit that cement, it's like hard as a brick, but if you hit it hard enough, it hits that nerve and it sends a tingle down your body that hurts like hell. And I mean, that was, that, that's, that was it. So um, I end up, having another surgery so now this is the second surgery to clean up and it gets a little better mm -hmm. but it's still not like how it should be and by this time greenberg leaves he goes to uh florida some school in florida okay. that end up being pretty good he leaves he leaves long beach state and then wayne morgan comes in yeah yeah he comes yeah. from syracuse and it's kind of like the same situation with uh, Samson, but not as bad. He didn't try to force us out, but he brought his own players. I remember he brought a kid from Florida that ended up only averaging like three points a game. You know, like Antron played, Lee. Antron Lee. And yeah. Antron, yeah. he wanted me to kind of take Antron under my wing and show Antron Long Beach and all this, but I'm like, I'm competing against Antron. We play the same position. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm like, you really want me to be friends with this kid? But, and I'm a junior by now. And I'm like, but Antron was a cool kid, but he ended up only averaging three points a game his whole career. You know what right. I'm saying? He brought in a kid named Quincy Knuckles, like a 6'2 guard that ended up not doing There's a funny story about this shit. So I get somewhat healthy. Uh, um, uh, Morgan comes in. Um, <laughs> Morgan thinks he a fucking pimp. He thinks he just moved his mother on the phone. I'm like, Morgan, man, sit your ass down. I know you're from New York, but stop it. We LA. <laughs> you know we, you know so he wanted to be the cool coach. Got a little jewelry on his little bracelet he wear. And probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like all coaches, and I've said this about all college coaches back then, they were all manipulators. They all tried to play us against each other to see what they could get out of us. You know mm -hmm, what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So uh, he tells me one day, and I had a fucking Toyota Corolla, like an old car my dad had. He said, I need you to go pick up this recruit from the airport. And my brother calls me and my brother used to work for the Moesha show. Mm -hmm. And this Kobe had just decided to be on the Moesha show, the, the, the TV show. He said, um, my brother called me. He said, hey, man, I can't make it to the airport because I'm doing something on set. Can you go to the airport and pick up this guy we need for the Moesha show? He's going to be on the show. And I'm like, who are you talking about? And he says, Kobe Bryant. I'm saying, you want me to go pick up Kobe Bryant? Like me? And at the same time, Morgan needed me to pick up Quincy Knuckles from the airport at Long Beach. The Long mm -hmm. Beach. Or it might have been LAX. One of them. But anyway, 
I'm trying to do right and trying to make sure I'm like staying coaches good graces. I, I didn't want to tell him like, yo, I need to go pick up Kobe Bryant when he needs me to go pick up this other recruit. And I missed my chance to probably build a relationship or a friendship with a young Kobe Bryant. Who knows what that car ride would have been like and mm -hmm. what could have happened. But I turned it down. I told my brother, I can't do it. I got to go pick this recruit up and I had to go pick up this recruit. So that was just a crazy story right there because no, no it, you never know how that relationship would have came out. Kobe probably would have took a liking to me. I could have been cool with him, been rolling with him all the way until, you know, the tragedy that happened, you know, but it's just uh, crazy how things come in your life and you never know which way they're going to the turn they're going to take by the decisions that you have to make. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, so uh, Morgan comes in, um, you know, I'm playing a little bit, um, you know, not as much as I want to, cause I'm still hurt. I'm still, I'm still never a hundred percent. I need another surgery, but I don't want to have another surgery because I'm tired of sitting out. I'm tired of missing games but you know, as a young kid that has some has some name has, has some pub about him in high school, when that when that when that light is kind of taken off of you, you're trying to rush to get back to that light instead of seeing the big picture. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that that kind of that kind of hurt me a little bit. Um, but I did I did end up leaving Long Beach and then playing one year at Dominguez. Um, oh, I, okay, okay. I went to Dominguez Hills D2 um, and it was good for me uh, because I had got into a couple altercations. Uh, I think me and B Yank had got into a fight uh, at Long Beach in practice. It is more of an on court thing where um, I elbowed him. He elbowed me. We was being physical. We hit each other. We squared up. I punched him in his fucking head. Did nothing happen because he had a big ass Barney rubble head and my head. <laughs> so, B, and the thing about B Yank, you know, uh, listen, I got my I got my feelings about him, the way he would talk shit, and he was from New, New York, York, and I York, felt yeah. like he was kind of like that do the right thing, Italian, white boy, with a little racist undertone, and I didn't like that shit. I didn't like it at all. He would make little comments, and I was like, nah, bro, you ain't going to get away with that shit. I don't give a fuck if you on my team or not. So we used to have our little problems on the court, and, uh, yeah, we squared up. Now, what did happen, and some people know about it, and this happened with Wayne Morgan, Marcus Johnson was on our team. The 6'10 cat was on our team. And we were doing some drills in practice. Um, and uh, he wasn't doing the drill the right way. He was he was kind of lagging, wasn't going hard. Well, we doing a drill and he messes the drill up. So on the way back, as we're walking back to the other end of the court to get back in line, I say something to him like, yo, man, he going to make us run if you don't get this shit going. And this motherfucker was a hothead. Anybody who mm. know no, Marcus had an emotional problem. Motherfucker had this prison time. He's 6'10". I'm 6'8 at the time. Mm -hmm. Just throwing a punch at Coach Greenberg a year ago because him and Greenberg got into an argument at practice or it was probably after game or something. Marcus didn't do something right. And he threw a punch. And we're looking at it like, like Marcus, like, yo, he crazy. And I, I knew Marcus. You know, I thought Marcus was cool. But anyway, I knew he had like a mental problem. As we're walking back, this motherfucker out of the out of nowhere, sucker punches me in the eye. And I'm like, yo, what the fuck? And so he hit me and I went down and I get back up. And then James kind of separates us. And I'm like trying to get at him, but I'm actually kind of dazed because this motherfucker is like 16. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never was expecting to punch. And Tommy Davis is on that team. And Tommy saw that shit and thought that like I said something to deserve it. And I was like, yo, bro, I didn't say shit. All I said to him was, man, we got to stop playing around in practice because Coach Morgan going to make us run these damn lines. And we weren't trying to run no lines. Mm -hmm. so they suspended him and everything. And then I just, I think I got stitches or something. I, I, I don't even know if I got stitches. I think it was just swollen. And, you know, from what I know now, dudes in the NBA got sucker punched, but I didn't like that shit. I didn't appreciate that shit. I wanted to go back at him, but James separated us and then, um coach morgan tried to calm everything down and he threw marcus out of practice and he told marcus you can't get back on the team unless you apologize to Corey because the shit was unprovoked you know what i'm saying it's different if i run up on you with my yeah head. yeah 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 For example we are literally walking side by side and i basically but i said something to trigger him and then the motherfucker just lost over me so what happened <laughs> my homeboys from inglewood found out 
So the next game or the next couple of games we had at the pyramid, I'm playing a lot more minutes now because I think Morgan trying to like appease the situation, give me yeah, more yeah, 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 yeah. But he he probably like I'm gonna just play him some more minutes just because. And I'm like, man, I know your ass is fake. I know you really don't care what happened to me because you brought your own players in trying to play them over the players that we already had at Long Beach State because that's what every coach do. They try to bring their own players in. They don't care about the players that are really there unless they're super superstars. And I had already sat out three years. Mm-hmm. Hadn't really had to prove myself because of the surgery. So he plays me all these other games and stuff. And I think I go, we play Purdue in a tournament. I get like eight or 10 points. We play George Mason. I get like six or something just based on the minutes. He's playing me. And they really can't play me a whole game because my leg is messed up. Like, right, 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 right. he doing me a favor by playing me, knowing that I'm frustrated that I, you know, that I don't want to have another surgery, but he plays me. But anyway, one game at the pyramid, the homies from the hood came and they all came in black hoodies. And I literally, and they was like, yo, we going to fuck Marcus up. And one, of, so it was four of my homies there and I didn't really give them the green light, but they was like, nah, bro, we on the way to Long Beach. When we, when we play that game and we leave, Marcus is walking to his car and all four of the homies surround him. And I think somebody on the team saw that shit. I was like, yo, man, y'all can't do that. He'll play on the team. And they was like, nah, we fucking him. Excuse my language. They was like, nah, we fucking him up. <laughs> it was ready to end his whole shit. And I was like, you know what? Don't do it. Call it. I'm on the team. It's going to look bad. I know y'all got my back, but don't do it. And they was like, all right, we standing down for you. But they showed up. And they came to the pyramid in black hoodies and sat at the top. And was waiting on him because you remember the pyramid. The only way you could get in is you come in at the top and you yeah walk, yeah walk yeah top. yeah walk all the way down. He was at the top waiting on him, so they was don't they was for show sure waiting on that fool. But you know he apologized, but I don't really think he took the apology serious because Marcus got a mental problem, but they never wanted to address it. It's always been guys on the team or any or any college team that's got a mental problem. Like they somebody is messed up, screwed up by the environment they grew up in or whatever, but they're just able to mm-hmm. function on the court or they're able to function a little bit in the classroom. And you know those, you know those guys. Yeah, the, cra- crazy dudes, yeah. Crazy dudes. You just got a crazy dude on the team. But like I said, he apologized. And I was like, man, whatever. And we haven't really spoken to this day. Like, I don't say nothing to him. He don't come my way. I don't even know where he's at. But mm-hmm. that right there, the way that situation was handled and then what me and Akili was going through, because Akili wasn't happy no more playing for Wayne Morgan. He decided to leave and transfer and go to Cal Poly. Mm -hmm. And I played one year at Dominguez. And then I think um, Shea had got out of his commitment to Long Beach and decided not to come. And then he went to UCLA. Well, he tried to go to UCLA, of course, and couldn't. Yeah, yeah, he was was with us. uh, Because he said, yeah, 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 yeah. he came in with us. So Um, that's, yeah. yeah. So so yeah, that's basically what happened. And then um, I get to Dominguez. I got to sit out like the first three games because it's, you know, Dominguez Hills D2. I play, I make all conference, but I had a third surgery. I had oh. to clean up because it still would go numb. But that third surgery actually cleared all the scar tissue out. I was able to play a full season. And then, um, you know, that was pretty much it. The coach there at the time, I think he passed away. I forget his name. He, um, he coached at, um, I want to say Gonzaga. Okay. Yeah, I think he was there when um, Steve Nash was there. He was the assistant. So, you know, he was he was kind of cool and everything. But, um, but yeah, yeah, he uh, he he ended up passing away. And I played a year at Dominguez. And it was, you know, it was good for me. It was good for me to get away from Long Beach, from everything mm-hmm. that happened, the surgery, the fights. <laughs> Transfer, the, I mean, you got to look at it. I had at least um, six coaches in five years because I go to Oklahoma, he leaves. Samson comes in. I go to Long Beach Greenberg there. Then Morgan comes in. Then I actually went to Dominguez because Calvin Mack, who played in the NBA, was the head coach. And then he gets fired for some things that he did with some money for a camp that he was running there. And he didn't. He 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 mis, misappropriated some funds there, so I actually went there to play for him, and then that's when the other coach from Gonzaga came. So I had six head coaches in five years. That's crazy. I had no stability with coaches, you know, the whole time that I played in college. You know, um, I look back on it now. I probably should have went to a local school, like you said. Like I know you mentioned about why do 
the LA cats leave and go to these big programs and not stay local. I really just wanted out of the hood. I had been in Inglewood so long. I hadn't really seen the world as an 18, 19 year old kid. I was like, man, let me go to Oklahoma. Let me mm-hmm. go to Nebraska. Let me go to Iowa. Cause these are all schools that recruited me. Um, so I'm thinking I want to get out of the hood. SC recruited me heavily. They recruited me just as hard as, as Oklahoma. I didn't want to go to SC. It does not look the same that it looked back in 1994. You know what I'm oh, saying? Oh, I remember SC back in the day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I didn't. I I just wanted to just explore the world. And I mean, look, I want to go to a big time program, but you know, sometimes I look at it now with the kid, the, the decisions that these kids are making now. They go to the smaller schools and they blow up. You know, they they get a lot of playing time. They play. It wasn't like that with me and you were playing. You wanted to go to a big time school. You yeah. wanted to go to a school that was on ESPN and every day or every other day. And our channel two, CBS used to carry all the, the college games. Mm-hmm. And whatever. So it the thinking wasn't the same. So, you know, um think that you know, times have changed. So that's kind of how that, you know, my college career went. So, you know. No, no, definitely, definitely. What would you say your biggest lesson you learned in college? Mm. the biggest lesson I learned in college oh to work harder you know I, I was blessed with so many gifts that came naturally being able mm-hmm. to handle ball being able to shoot but you got to train we mm-hmm. the guys and I think your generation caught it first the way these guys train now is like unbelievable just the drills they go through the shooting mm-hmm. drills um, you know, the techniques that they use, the moves, they taught us fundamentals and the basics. But as the game has evolved, as you see now, these kids are just the step backs is different, the crossovers are different. Um, you know, the passing is kind of still the same. I always have vision, but some of the other tools and some of the other ball handling stuff that these kids are learning now in these specialized workout sessions, I mean, it really is taking the game above and beyond so i think just training more and being in a gym more is what i learned that you have to do because once you get to the college level everybody's an all-american or a high school great in their city mm-hmm. so now the college team you got 12 other guys that was the shit in their own city so That's true. you know what i'm saying you sometimes you take for granted that you're good but that you still have to improve each and every year. You can't just sit back and think it's just going to happen. You got to stay in that gym day in and day out, especially if you want to take it to the next level. No, I agree. I mean, I ain't never shot no thousand jump shots. I might have shot 500, but you got to shoot a thousand. You got to shoot 15. You got to shoot 2000 jump shots. You got to work on your ball handling every day, but everything came so natural to me. It was like, I always could handle the ball. It was anything, you know, but, but you got to be almost, excellent in everything that you do on the court now because all these guys are skilled i mean you i was just showing tamia the number one pick coming out of france or europe next year the seven two guy he's handling the ball like a like a guard yeah one bit yeah yeah that's unheard i didn't know who this kid was until about six months ago i'm Mm -hmm. like this is incredible he's seven two (laughs) (laughs) he might be seven three i say he might be jimmy yeah that's crazy. Can you mm-hmm. imagine coaches allowing him to do that back then? They would have never allowed him to play the way that he's playing. No, no, no. And I think coaches made a big mistake in that. Some of the coaches have evolved now and they're kind of like opening up their, mm-hmm. their ears to things. But like back then, they were so focused on if you seven feet, you got to play down low. But man, this kid is amazing. I'm like, gee, I mean, what what's next? Like, how do you go? I like I look at um the Milwaukee Bucks guy, uh the uh Oladipo, whatever. What's his name? Um, uh Giannis. Giannis, I'm sorry, I'm coming to Giannis Santa Cupo, yeah, yeah. Santa Cupo. He's six eleven, built like uh, massive, and he's taking it coast to coast all the time. Like, how do you stop that? Like this unheard of. Six eleven. When he started doing it, I was like, are they really gonna let him dribble the ball that far from coast to coast and just get like he makes the game look like he's playing against little kids? Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. It's crazy. So uh, that's probably the biggest lesson that I learned: just stay in the gym, stay hungry, and you got to keep improving each and every year. All right. What would you say your greatest triumph was in college? Greatest triumph in college. Uh, I guess. 
it wasn't a lot because I was hurt. <laughs> I'm trying to do, I, I mean, like oh, I did do this move against San Jose State. If I can find a video, uh, it's a legendary move. So we're playing at San Jose. We're up. This is when Greenberg was there, and I'm still coming off the first surgery. But he's putting me in the game, you know, trying to see how my leg is going to test out. So against San Jose State, I get the re defensive rebound mm -hmm. and taking it coast to coast where there's two defenders at half court that are trying to steal the ball. I throw it behind my back and split the defenders and get the ball back and get to the middle of the key. I fake it like magic, like I'm on pass. I get fouled and lay that thing up. The crowd erupts. My grandmother's in the seat because she's never really seen me play. Mm -hmm. And the crowd is going crazy. Fellas on the benches. I mean, I guess it was a legendary move because everything was just instinctive. I went behind the back, split two defenders, got to the middle of the key, and the defenders converged on me. And I faked like I was going to pass, got fouled, laid that thing up. So that's probably one of my coldest moves ever. That's probably okay. one of my <laughs> But I mean, we won. We look, we won the Big West Championship, but I think. That was a year I transferred in, so I couldn't play. Mm. So that was a big accomplishment for the team. But, I mean, I guess just me trying to battle back off injuries, trying to get as many minutes as I could. You know, I, I can't really be mad at Greenberg because I used to be, like, pissed off like he wasn't putting me in the game that much. But I was hurt. I, I, I legitimately was hurt. Like, I look back on it now, and I was like, fuck, if you banged into my leg, and the nerve you fall, yeah, you fall I down. Fall down because I had no feeling in that in that leg. So I I mean, you know, I I, I was just frustrated. But then when I got to Dominguez, I got a chance to play the whole season. Really, really built some good friendships at Dominguez. Uh Jair Frey was a good friend of mine, Kevin Polk. Uh so I got a chance to really play a full season and 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 not have to worry about my leg anymore. Okay, okay. Well, obviously your career is over at, at Cal State Dominguez. Uh, yeah. What was next for you? Just trying to get overseas, just trying to get a look. Um, I got a bunch of workouts with different agents and stuff like that. Um, you know, just, just trying to go to, uh, they used to have these mini workouts for players. For, so they would bring these overseas guys over, these players to play against seniors or whatnot that had just graduated that were trying to get a look overseas so for me i just went to some of the semi-pro leagues i went to uh god i forget the name of the leagues but they had them all over you know before they started the g league they had a bunch uh -huh. of semi-pro and i think i played in uh where did i go i went to minnesota i went to uh damn what was the name of that city oh uh, god i forget the name of it it was close to minneapolis I forget the name of the city I was in, Rochester. Okay. Rochester. So they had a semi pro team up there. And I it was not, it wasn't the CBA, but I think it was something close to it. So I played in a bunch of um semi pro leagues. And then I got a chance to go overseas and play in New Zealand, uh, because my cousin Dale, who went to Inglewood High and played with Reggie Theus, he had been in New Zealand since the late seventies, early eighties. Oh had, wow. He had made a life for himself over there. And my goal was to go play in New Zealand and get over to Australia because Australia had a really good league back then and they still do. Yeah. So that was what, you know, that I decided to do. I, I kept playing in the semi-pros and then I said, I want to go play. So I went over, over to New Zealand for about six, seven months, but things didn't really work out like I thought they would. I mean, I would come to practice and people would be smoking cigarettes in the locker room. I'm like, <laughs> like I, didn't really, I didn't understand it. I was a ass kid and I know that they do that in Italy, but I'm like, yo, I'm, I'm trying to take the game as serious as possible and they smoking damn cigarettes in the locker room. So, <laughs> six months, man, I came back home. I think I went to a couple of other semi-pro leagues that were kind of close to the NBA, but after that, I just said, you know what? If it wasn't meant in the cars to be, let me just start working and find another interest. And the film business became an interest of mine. So I just got into that. I got into that. Well, before we get into the film interest, you know, like the film stuff, okay. what would be your best advice for the next generation of, of yourself? Like say you had a son and he kind of grew up the same. He was growing up the same way you did with all the pub and everything that coming up growing up. What would be the, your best advice for the next generation? 
uh, you know, don't listen to the outside uh, voices. Um, bet on yourself. Be confident. You know, for me, I was confident, but I didn't have the swag until I got to college. I didn't. I, I wasn't that kid that walked around like with a chip on his shoulder or his held hell high. A lot of people think that, but I didn't. I mean, I had a mean streak, but I had to be provoked to get it out of me. Um, but you got to have confidence. You got to walk around sometimes like you are the shit. So when you step mm -hmm. on the court, you understand can't nobody beat you. And I didn't really have that. I didn't have that at the time. I knew I could play. I knew I was good, but I didn't have that swag right away. So if you train hard and your game is tight, you're going to have that swag. So my advice would be train as hard as you can. Do your weights, eat right, get your sleep. I mean, you got to treat your body like a business because, you know, like I said, when you get ready to go to the next level, if it's college or if it's pros, everybody is just as good as everybody else. It's really about the work ethic. I mean, look at LeBron. This dude is 38 years old, still killing. And that's because he has the financial means to spend a million dollars on his body. Everybody don't have that. Yeah. But you got to invest in yourself like that to, to have longevity. Because a lot of cats, as you know, they'll enter the league at 22. They're out by 28. And you're still young as hell. Then they spend all their money. Then they broke. Then they might end up on the street or they might end up doing things that they really don't want to get involved in. Look at um, look at uh, the Prince. Remember Tommy Prince? Remember? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Tayshaun Prince on the brother. Yeah. Didn't he get in trouble trying to do a drug deal or something and doing some crazy shit? And, I mean, it's just like those are the type of decisions that you make when you don't follow the path that was laid out in front of you. You know what I'm saying? We all make bad decisions. We all can recover, but some people go off on a deeper end. And I know Tommy and I was like, damn, he really, you know, he really tried to do that. But that's what you don't want to get caught up in. You don't want to get caught up being around the wrong people to make you make wrong decisions. You know, you got to stay close to family and look, sometimes family's not always the best because all they want to do is get in your pocket, but you got to find a group of people that got your best interests and stick with those people. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. that would be advice for the young generation because so much is thrown at them now. You got you got the NIL deals now. You got agents. You got boosters. You got all kind of people who want to throw money at you because they know you might be the next big thing. And run one wrong decision can ruin your whole career. So you just got to. I mean, look at look at look at the boy from Memphis, Ja. I mean, twenty two years old, twenty three, got all that money, but you want to tote a gun on. Instagram for what? First of all, <laughs> anybody who got blue dreads ain't from the hood. I'm sorry, I don't get fucked with New Chicago. No, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> New Chicago. I know what's up. I got family in Chicago because like, you can't tell me nothing. I don't have to check in. I ain't checking in with nobody. I got family there. I went to Chicago when I was 13 years old. When I got off of of of, of, of I think we had a motor home. My family took down there. My uncle did. They said, "Hey, bro, do not wear your hat this way. Do not wear your hat that way." And I don't even wear hats like that. So I know what's up. I didn't been in almost every hood there is in the U.S. So I know this nigga, he's not a gangster. He's not. And so it's like, stop trying to be something that you're not because you're about to ruin all your money, all your endorsement deals. The dude is a phenomenal ball player, but you're not a gangster, bro. None of these guys, none of these dudes in the NBA right now are gangsters. They all want to be tough guys. Most of them don't even fist fight. <laughs> they all, you know it was funny Travis because when I started coaching at the Drew League I'm looking at their bodies they all look like smoked out skateboarders with tight jeans on coming to the arena because I'm like where is the muscle mass on these guys like all y'all supposed to be tough but none of y'all got no big ass muscles to be tough you know me and you, I grew up in the 80s I grew up in the 90s I know how physical basketball was I know right, when you right, right. just it they just let it go you know what I'm saying? But now if you even touch somebody or something, you know, it's a foul or a flagrant foul. Or if you look at somebody crazy, you know what I mean? So it's they, they need to stop trying to act like these rappers who are not even tough. You can't wear the tightest skinny jeans in the world and let the skinny jeans be multi be multicolored skinny jeans and you a gangster. They didn't stop that shit. <laughs> well, no, it's always <laughs> funny when I see it. You know, I always see like, dude, you rich. Dudes do gang banging and stuff that you to, to try exactly. to get rich, you know? Like, you rich already. You don't even need a game. Just be you. And I've been saying that to be anybody you. who's, just be you. You don't have to be it's any any real, real gangster, but just tell you, dog, 
Just be you. You don't want to be where but I'm at. Who gonna, but who he gonna beat up? Have you seen his body? He not a big dude. Who is going? Who is who is going to be intimidated by most of these cats in the league that don't have no muscle mass on them? They not no big dudes, so they right. all are trying to play a role, man. And it's really gonna hurt the league unless somebody, a veteran, steps and say, "Man, y'all need to shut that shit down and just play the game. Just be you, like you say. Just be you. Stop trying yep, to be a tough. Yep, yep. to be what you see on TV because that's not them. Okay, none of them. Don't nobody want to go to jail. Nobody." Yeah. You know what I'm no, saying? You're right. You're right. I done had my brushes with the law. So I, I I know what that shit like. That shit ain't fun. As fast as I had to go in that motherfucker, as fast as I was trying to get out. I, was, <laughs> I, won't be, I won't be in no cell with no whole bunch of dudes. That shit ain't sexy. Right. If, if, if you roll that way, now if you roll that way, that's on you. Let me not judge. I don't want to be around that trap. I want to be around the ladies. I like the ladies. <laughs> like, the Martin, the Martin like the ladies. I want to be around. Ain't that right, baby? That's right. Look at that. I like the ladies. <laughs> I'm going to keep some drink. And I'm going to keep a lady next to me. Be around with a whole bunch of dudes. I don't want to be in a, in a fucking cell with a whole bunch of dudes. Like, I'm gangster. Like, man, get the fuck out of here. Like, I, I mean, and me, I like the Oh, oh my. Well, then. Nah, nah, you funny, though. Hey, call you funny as a motherfucker, though. No, no, man. Yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead. I'll get you, you Sorry, go. he threw me off, y'all. He threw yeah, me I, off. I, I, he threw me I, off. Hey, I'll be. Hey, I'm trying, I'm gonna keep it real. When I was a freshman in Oklahoma, I wouldn't even get undressed to take a shower. I ain't want to be in there with them fools. I don't, you know what I'm saying? That, but I wasn't comfortable. I was like, hey, man, that's just y'all too much. I know. They got all gender bathrooms now and shit. Like, nah, bro, this ain't where I grew up in. I'm not, no, man. I, that's why I tell anybody, you do not want to go to jail. That shit is not cool. That I got shit, you. Nah. No, nah, I got you. Yeah. Now, now, I do want to go back a little bit. Like, mm -hmm. after you, after you obviously, you know, quit the sport, right? Were you, did you ever have an itch to want to come back? Or was it just like, oh, I'm done, I'm done, let's forget it now? I did. I mean, <laughs> as crazy as it sounds, I was like in my best shape after I stopped playing basketball. Um, I started working at a couple movie studios and uh, they had weight rooms there. So I literally would leave, leave the office and go straight down to the weight room, get on a treadmill, lift weights. I was big as shit. I was like, <laughs> I was working out at least four or five times a day. And there was a couple basketball leagues I would play in. So I was still active playing, just trying to stay in shape because I never wanted to be one of those guys who stopped playing that blew up, that you didn't recognize, that gained like 300 pounds. And you looking at, damn, that's you. I don't remember you being that big. So I always would kind of stay active. And what happened when the third installment of the documentary was about to be negotiated and filmed for ESPN 30 for 30, um, I had expressed to one of the um, producers that I, you know, still felt like I wanted to play or try to play. I think at the time I might have been 35, but I felt like I was in good shape. I was working out. I was running. I was having playing ball. But I mean, look, when you're away from the game that long and you're not as competitive and you're sitting in the office all day, all kind of shit run through your mind. Right, so, right, 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 right. So I decided to um, I decided to give it a go. Um, I went to Canada, tried out for the Canadian league, but I really didn't get a chance to prepare myself for the camp that they were running, um, I guess, to draft players. And I think you had to play like five games in six days. And sometimes you had to play back to back. So I thought I was in pretty good shape, but I was just like in so, so shape. So I think around the third game, um, I might've pulled something in my leg or my leg wasn't responding the way it was should have responded. Mm -hmm. I played well enough to make the all-star team up there. So all the little GMs and the scouts could decide to draft when the draft came. Because what they would do was they would have these mini camps and then they would draft the players based on the mini camps. So I was good enough to make the top 24. I'm the oldest guy there. Nobody really knew. I was like 35. But I couldn't play in the all-star game because I had pulled something in my leg because they were playing two games a day. Right, 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 right. I think Michael Ray Richardson was coaching a team up there, you know, after he got his life together, after everything he went through in the NBA. And he talked to me. He said, man, we could use somebody like you because you're skilled. You pretty much can play the three, four for us and you can pass. But he just didn't really know how my body would respond. So I think if I would have had more time to get my body in tip-top shape, 
because the documentary people wanted to capture me playing but they didn't want to give me enough time to really get in shape because they needed the film so they could put everything together, you know, for, for the ESPN 30 for 30 thing. So right. yeah, that was a thing. That was, a, that was my only comeback. And then um, I end up, you know, not getting drafted, whatever, but I still had to itch to play. So I started playing in the uh, Drew uh, Veteran League, which ended up being really cool. I got a chance to see a bunch of guys that I hadn't seen in a while that were from my class that were still active, still playing. I didn't even know the Drew Veteran League existed. One of my boys, uh, Jerome Brat Brantley, Jay Brantley, Jay Boogie, what we call him, he put a team in there and I played on that team and Terrell Owens was playing and a bunch of other guys that I didn't know were playing, you know, that I had played high school against and college. They were playing in it as well. And it just became a fun environment. And me and T.O. became really, you know, pretty good friends. That's how I met T.O. playing in the in the Drew uh, Veteran League, and that was just it was just cool. Dino ran it. Him and his daughter uh, Chanel ran it, and um, you know they run the regular Drew. So what happened? Um, Ron Artez needed some players to play on his regular Drew League team, mm -hmm. and uh, my boy at the time, Tony Farmer, he asked a group of us to fill in because Ron didn't have his full squad at the regular Drew League. So we end up playing like four or five of us end up playing in the reg on, on Ron Artest team and the regular Drew. And then that's how I got reacquainted with the Drew League. That's mm -hmm. how I got back in the Drew. So I played like one year at the Drew at like 38. And it was just fun. And I'm gonna be honest with you, Travis. I was thinking to myself, like, only reason I want to play at the Drew League, because when I played in it when I was like playing college and playing overseas. Right. They didn't have no sponsorship by Nike. So I wanted me a Nike bag, Nike shoes, and all that. <laughs> So I was like, y'all sponsored by Nike now? And Dino like, yeah, we got Nike. We got a Nike deal. And I'm saying all this Nike stuff. I'm like, man, let me give me a bag or something. Let me let me play in this league and get some shit. So that's how I got reacquainted with the Drew League. And then um, I coached JaVale, JaVale McGee's team with this one guy named Day Day. And they basically was 0-9 until I coached the one game as a head coach by myself. And they ended up being 1-10. And that was the only game that they won when I coached it because they couldn't coach that day. And I started, you know, kind of asking questions about how could I jump on somebody's team to coach. And I was interested in coaching because I wasn't playing anymore. Now, at this point, I'm like 38, 39. I decided to put a team into the 40 and over, which is a bet league. And I got Keon Kendrick, who was coaching in the Drew, to coach my veteran team. So me and Keon became cool. And Keon knew who I was. Mm -hmm. He was like, I remember you when I was growing up and you played at Morningside. I didn't know who Keon was. I had heard his name and I hadn't, I think I knew he went to Dominguez, but I didn't know him, know him like that. So we became really cool. That's my guy to this day. Um, he asked me, or he he told me, he said, see, because I tried to ask uh, Kevin Matthews to coach one of his teams and he acted like he didn't have no space for me. The year that I asked Kevin Matthews to coach on his team and Kevin went to my high school in Morningside, Keon said I could be the assistant on his team. That same year, me and Keon in 2018 won the Drew League Championship. So wow. I got to take my hat off and put it on Kevin's head and say, see, if you would have put me on your staff, you might would have got one of these. <laughs> <laughs> I did that shit. And me and Keon was laughing because I was like, Keon, because Keon had never won a championship. Okay. And he had made it to maybe the first or second round. But when I started coaching with him, made it all the way. My first year coaching in the Drew with him, we won a championship. So that was 18. And now I'm back coaching with him after COVID and everything. And my first year back coaching with him was last year. And he got to the second round. So now I'm trying to get him back to the championship. But the Drew League has been a good experience for me because away from work in the summertime, it gives me an outlet to coach, to meet the players, to meet the new players, and to keep my, you know, to 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 to, to keep my juices going around basketball. Cause I do think eventually at some point I'm going to coach. I just mm -hmm. don't know where, or, you know, if it's high school, college, but I know I want to coach. So it, it it gives me a platform to do that. And I'm and I'm you know, and I'm happy about it. I'm happy that I rediscovered the Drew League. Cause I had you know, when I stopped playing, I left everything alone. I left basketball alone. I didn't really, you know, get involved at AAU or nothing like that. But like I say, the Drew League allowed me to get to get back into basketball.
Okay. Yeah. No, that's always good when you can come back in some way, shape, show my, shape, form, or fashion. Um, well, I want to say it's been an honor and a pleasure today, sir. I appreciate it, Corey, man. Like you, you know, coming back on, like I said, and finally get it in with me. Um, I have one more question before we call it. Okay. Uh, it's always a, you know, question I always leave to the end. So it's not like at some point in your, you know, career, we all have low points, you know, whether it's overseas, whether it's, you know, college, high school, whatever. Um, I want to, want to know, like, how did you get over your low point? And was it like through family? Was it through God? Was it through meditation? Uh, how did you get over your low point and how'd you move forward? You know, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think the surgery was the low, my injury. And I can't really call it an injury because it's kind of fluke that, you know, you have a calcium deposit grow. You know, I hear a lot of track runners say that they get these deposits that grow that they have to get removed. So it's like extra bone that grows and it was cut into my calf. That probably was my lowest point. My dad's a minister, so God has always been in the house. So I've always had faith that I could bounce back. But I don't know if I prayed a lot. I don't know if I prayed enough. And not knowing what was going to be in front of me future-wise, that that was that was probably my lowest point because I'm thinking to myself, I don't think I'm going to recover from this surgery just by the way the surgery happened and the way that my leg was cut and it didn't heal properly. I didn't know. But the one thing about it, Travis, I never let basketball define who I was going to be in life. A lot of people can only associate their success with what they did on the court. I never was that type of person. So I was always like, well, if I can't play basketball, I'm smart enough to do something else. I am mm-hmm. creative to do something else. You know, that's why I surrounded myself with the people who produced and directed the documentaries because I took an interest in film and TV from that standpoint. And then that's what I'm doing now. You know, I'm a creative executive over at Slash Studios, you know, which is owned by LA Talent, LA Model. So now Slash has given me the opportunity to be creative, to 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 work, um, and to fulfill, you know, my interest in 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 film and TV. So I never let basketball dictate or define the type of person I was going to be or the type of human I was going to be. And a lot of guys live that way. A lot of guys can never recover from not being successful on the court, you know, or maybe not even being, being unsuccessful on the court. You know, they, they, they equate, uh, equate everything to basketball. Like, oh yeah, mm-hmm. I'm a basketball mm-hmm. star and blah, 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 blah. But then when it doesn't happen for them no more, they go into depression. I'm never going yeah. to mm-hmm. That. So, it, a ton of us happened to a ton of us so yeah, yeah. And, I'm, and i'm beginning to realize that with some of the guys that i played with you know they can never get over the fact that they might just be a regular guy now but it's okay you got to find an interest that want that that makes you want to get up every morning and be productive so mm-hmm. you know, the entertainment business was that for me mm-hmm. so i got a rush out of it i like to be creative i like to put projects together and, and you know that, that's what i do you know um i'm thinking about right now doing a reality show on Frank Nitty, Franklin Sessions, who plays at the Drew, because he's been dominating the Drew the last three, four years. He's won a bunch of MVPs back to back, like three or four of them, I think. And so we've been in talks with him to do a reality show based on him being like the number one street baller in the state of California. And mm. one of my friends is a Gil Knight. He is a world renowned Emmy award winning director of documentary sports documentaries. Mm-hmm. And he's nine Emmy awards. So now I'm bringing them two together actually tomorrow to have a meeting in the office, in my office to discuss this project. So those are the kind of things that get me going. You know, I'm able to use my resources to do projects that are of interest to me and that might be interest to, you know, to, to everyone else. So. All right. Well, that makes sense, man. Like I said, everybody needs a passion, whatever it is is going to be after, you know, like after you sports, sports can't be forever. Unless you're going into coaching, like you said, or whatever the case is. But it's always good that you have a passion outside of it to kind of like ground yourself to something, you know, like new, you know. So, but once again, Corey, like I said, uh, thank you for coming on, big bro. I appreciate it. Um, You you know, obviously let let the people know where they can find you, you know, if they're looking for something. 
Yeah, you can find me just on Instagram. Uh, the IG is 33 underscore money underscore 33. And Instagram is where I be. That's it. No other social media. <laughs> I think I got a Facebook page, but I'm never on there. I don't tweet. I did no no Twitter, no uh, TikTok. I don't do none of that. And if there's anything else out there, I don't even know about it. So <laughs> that's no, it. I got you. <laughs> no, I got you. Well, you can you can follow me on Instagram uh, at Travis W Reed. That's R E E D, uh, Travis W, and on Facebook Travis W Reed. I post all my social medias on on both those sites. On my Instagram page, I do have a LinkedIn tree. So uh, if you want to catch individual episodes like this one, uh, it will be up on that. You know, as soon as I post it, uh, post about it. Um, also, if you like, I said, if you're still looking for that Athlete's Journey merch. Still have the, some of that, so just DM me or message me inside. Uh, message, I mean, message me on Facebook. So, uh, like I said, we're going to keep growing. We're going to keep grinding with this show. Uh, we appreciate it, like I said, and uh, we're going to keep going. Peace. All right, bro.